Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Learn with Jason. Today on the show, we've got Ulf. I didn't even ask you how to pronounce your last name, so I'm it's, not going to try. It's all can good. You, Nobody can, can. It's a mystery. I just like, I, I was like, Ulf. That's it, right? Like, <laughs> that's it. It's basically, it's like one breath in and oh, like one, one <laughs> word out. It's pronounced Schwiekendieg for, for the ones who care. Schwiekendieg. You don't have to try that. Oof. It's hard. Schwiekendieg on the show today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so I'm super excited about what we're going to do today. But before we get into doing things, let's talk a little bit about you and, uh, and your background, if you don't mind sharing. Of course, of course. Um, uh, as you might have heard from the weird name, which is, by the way, like the Mike of Sweden. It's such a common name. Funny enough, I am not Swedish. I'm German. That's what that accent is. There's, I think, to all I know, one famous German Ulf. He was an astronaut, I think, in like the early 70s or 80s or something like that. Uh, I might totally got that wrong. But there's like an astronaut with the name Ulf. And so, you know. The one other German in there, exactly. <laughs> so um, I am a trained engineer, um, software engineer, went to undergrad back home in Germany, right afterwards uh, left for, you know, the promised land here and, uh, and went to um, study CS um, in, in grad school at, um, in Montreal. And uh, throughout all my time of going to school, I always worked like doing my undergrad. I worked as a software engineer at Siemens. Um, through my grad schools, I worked for companies like Ericsson Research, um, mm -hmm. Microsoft Research in my second time of grad school, where I switched over to study actually a lot more UX, um, which was amazing to think of. Um, how people interact with the software that you're using. So I think these two skills go hand in hand together and kind of go a little bit on like what we're doing here. So a little bit more visual on like programming and whatnot later on. Sure. Um, did some really cool companies that I was part of uh, and super happy, like um, luckily ran into, I was, um, I was in the original Siri team before Apple acquired us and then at Apple um i started a company Wait, afterwards a, a quick a quick aside today i learned that siri wasn't born inside of apple i thought that siri oh my was god a, you did apple not know original. that no it not. was not an apple original we were 21 people and apple acquired us for an undisclosed amount wow yeah well, that's that's exciting part of internet history there yeah yeah, we were we were uh, doing this, um, I believe, for a little over two years, even. Yes, it actually came originally um, out of SRI, the Stanford Research Institute. They had a okay. very interesting virtual assistant program that uh, Adam Chire was running. He's one of the founders and uh, amazing person. So yeah, Siri uh, was acquired by Apple. Very cool. Um, very very cool. Turns out once I was in my first real startup um, from like all these big companies beforehand, uh, in Germany, you say you, you, uh, you smell blood and you wanted to do more of that rather than go and work for the big corporation. So I left Apple actually pretty quickly and, uh, and started with a friend of mine, um, our first company together. It was called Ditto. I don't know if you remember these buzzwords back it's almost 10 years ago, the social local mobile days of like the four squares mm. and the koalas. And we were one yep. of those companies that came out of that uh, had our launch party at South by Southwest and, uh, and eventually ended up um, joining with the team at Groupon and sold our company to them. Um, we, we opened up actually the first San Francisco office for Groupon and okay. uh and did something that wasn't about coupons at all. It was about the intersection of consumers and merchants and how, you know, Groupon was one of the only companies that had a large customer base in both. And like what cool, mm. unique experience could we develop or like research and like actually connect these two together. Think of like going into a restaurant, op op opening your menu on your phone. Like now that's kind of during COVID time, it's kind of the no new normal, right? You scan a barcode, right. you like see the menu on your phone. 
we went a little farther and you could like order from it and then just walk away out of it and we would detect that you left and uh, and could charge your credit card on fire for instance oh, some really yeah. cool experiences that you know i love that kind of stuff i i think it's so interesting the way that you can push the the boundaries now that we all have a small portable computer that's location aware and identity aware and it's got our credit cards in it and you know it's so many cool things can happen now that we're we're starting to hit that space and um yeah that's that's really fun but so now that's not what you're doing now right you've you've that's not what i'm on. doing at all so i, I moved on i like i lo loved uh love working for group one and eventually got a got a couple more times the the, the startup um bug uh i did a company um, with uh, the CEO of Groupon, Andrew Mason, afterwards, um, called Detour, um, okay. that was a location-aware uh, audio walking tours guide. That's the best I can explain oh, it. Cool. Think of think of Ken Burns walking you over the Brooklyn Bridge, and everything is location-aware. So you're listening to Ken Burns walking over the bridge, and out of a sudden he says, "Stop, notice," and you stop. All your friends are with you. All of the audio is in sync. And he's like, notice the people just like swath, like walking alongside of you. They don't know what they're missing. Just look down. And he like <laughs> points something out on like the bridge that nobody else of those tourists like knows. And you get like these goosebump moments when that happens. That's, you know, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. If I think about Ken Burns walking me down the Burnside Bridge at least twice a day. So this sounds like a company that I definitely I missed out on. It was really, really fun. Um, we ended up selling it to Bose. Sadly, it's not been revived since. Sure. Um, last last startup that that's that was really fun. Um, mostly also from a technology stack um, was that I had my hands on was called Descript. Where it's called Descript. If anybody of you does oh, podcasts, I love Descript. You should you should probably have tried it or or use it. Um, from a technology standpoint, I'm super, super proud of it because I pushed the team to use Electron um, to build the mm -hmm. entire, like an entire audio editor and now video editor, which is quite hard to do, especially in the early versions of Electron. But it, the speed you gained by like iterating quickly through the product by like using a web stack versus like a native Mac OS stack is phenomenal. So it was really, really yeah. fun. Um, and then just before I started what I'm doing right now, um, I was uh, part of Postmates as an engineering manager. Oh, okay. I was in charge, one of their three verticals there, the fleet team. So anything from like fulfillment, um, uh, the a handful of like backend and front end teams, the mobile um, career app, um, That that's what I was overseeing. And from there, it really crystallized to to see how inefficient tech workers are working. You know, you and I mm. spend probably a lot too much time in meetings, in discussions, and don't get actually a lot of time to code. And that's why we became engineers, right? We, we love this <laughs> feeling of like getting deep into flow, like forgetting time around us, building something with our head, um, because I guess our hands are not that good um but uh at least we're, we're creating something and and we don't get to do that much and yet we're paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to these extremely smart intelligent people to sit in in meetings most of the time and i felt there has to be something that helps everybody to feel more connected back to their code that okay. while you while you said yes, it's great that we have a mobile computer in our phone. I also think it dramatically changed our life in a way that we are losing attention to detail, and that we cannot focus for a long time on anything anymore. Right? We are living in the in the time of like infinite scrolls through social media, through like Twitter and out or TikTok or whatever it is, and out of a sudden. An hour came, an hour got by, and you know you have to do something. You got to go to the next meeting or whatsoever. So I think really you know, like focusing on reclaiming I, that loss of attention is important. I, I one of the like one of the things that I've always joked about is that somebody needs to make a uh, 
a, a line chart that just shows like average time spent on the toilet by human beings and it just show the spike when smartphones came in where it's you know it was like almost no time and now it's like a significant portion of your day <laughs> i don't know what you're and talking it's about it's the great, infinite great scroll. materials it's like, <laughs> yeah right oh i'm just gonna read all of twitter before i leave right it's like yeah. you just it, yeah i i'm very on board with that i i think that is a, a very true thing I'm seeing this even more now. Like uh, I'm a I'm a first time father of a nine and a half month old, and sometimes I kid you not, the bathroom is kind of like your your like safe haven of of you know nobody crying, nobody wanting anything from you, and so yeah, you're like, you know, get back quickly. You know, I, I don't have kids, of but I've school. I've heard that only lasts until they can reach the doorknob. I hear so. I hear that as well. Yeah, there's already like the rambling outside of the door that might happen. Um, but, but yeah, and so so with, you know, with where our society is going, and I and, and I know you've probably seen it in like the social dilemma, for instance, that really shows us like okay, social media brought us closer together and brought like, you know, a, a town square like feel to you know connecting people it also really created a, a generation or even like modified a generation into kind of brainless zombies to some point, right? Mm. Of like, you just keep on just one more hit, one more, you know, dopamine rush, one more, you know, way of getting, uh, it, it's like emails. You just get so quickly addicted to it. Mm. And, uh, and I believe if we can imagine a world where, we do that in a healthy way only like we do it with anything else. That's not good for you. Alcohol, you know, any drugs or whatsoever, like TV. And you, you focus more on the time that you're getting back to do something meaningful with your life. Mm. Um, uh, just imagine a world where people would not spend 20 minutes on the toilet instead of, and you know, getting 15 minutes of coding in, right? Mm. What would we have created? Like, where would we be? What new companies would have come out? What new amazing libraries like other engineers can build on would have been invented in that time where we just well, you know, and, remember and, how and, to focus again. And, and what I like, there's, there's two sides of that too, right? Because there's the, you know, if we, if we focus on it from a productivity standpoint and we say, you know, look, throughout your day, you've got all these micro distractions. And if you took that time back and you were productive, what could you build? And I love that. I think that's a really good way to look at it. I think there's another side to this too, though, which is that a lot of days I feel like by the end of the day, I'm just ragged. I have no, fo I'm completely drained of all of my executive function. I'm exhausted. And I look back at what I did and I'm like, I didn't get very much done. So in addition to not being productive, I also wasted all of my relaxation time, my break time, my time to just be disconnected on these small spurts of scrolling through Twitter or trying to read Reddit or, or doing something that, that, you know, just took 20 minutes of my time that I didn't really value. I just couldn't bring myself to go back to work. And then I find myself, well, okay, well, I screwed around for three hours at work today, so I should probably work a little bit later. So now it's 7 p.m. And, and you're exhausted. I'm like, ugh. Yeah, right. And so then I go and I'm exhausted. I go sit in front of the TV and I keep looking at my phone while I'm on the TV. I heard somebody make the joke that, you know, our lives are, are working on the medium rectangle so we can sit at night in front of the big rectangle and look at our small rectangle. <laughs> and that is a, a, a very depressing framing for it. But I do think, you know, on days when I get up and I focus and I shut, you know, I, I work seven to three are my normal hours. So if I get up, at, I start at seven, I shut down at three, I focus the whole day. I can also be completely disconnected from three until nine when I go to bed. And I get that really solid six hours of being a person that's not working, not looking at a screen. I can, and I have energy left. Right. And, and so, yeah, I think it goes both ways. It's productivity and it's, it's recovery. So you said something really important um, that I want to underline, and that is you feel extremely tired when you just do these small micro interactions or, or mm -hmm. context switching. Um, 
we are so used to, and I think through the rise of computers, frankly, like I, I feel like we, we, especially engineers, like believe for a long time that if a computer can multitask, you know, it's probably a good thing that I can do that too. There actually has been research done around it and we cannot, our brain is wired mm -hmm. differently than a computer. We can do two things if we're really good and well-trained at the same time, actively. Mm -hmm. Um, and even that, the rarest amount of people can do it. So by just focusing to do, to tell yourself for the next 25 minutes, I'm going to do one thing. I put everything on do not disturb. We have these boxes that we give everybody um, where you put your phone in and just lock mm -hmm. it away for that time and just do 25 minutes of uninterrupted focus time, no matter what you do, if you code, if you design, if you read something, if you do your laundry, whatever it is that you need to do, do it uninterrupted and sure. then give yourself a break. The craziest part is if you just practice that for one day, you're not exhausted. You have no problem recollecting like what you have done that day. It, it is such a simple solution to something that sounds so hard to achieve. But mm -hmm. if you put yourself in that right mindset and say, look, almost nothing in the world can wait. Uh, could like uh, pretty much anything in this world can wait for 25 minutes. Um, right. And, and if it's not, then, you know, somebody will continuously call me, my box will buzz or, you know, like they will get through to like my watch or whatsoever to really, you know, stuff is on fire mm. kind of thing. Right. You know how often that you happens know, once a month at most. I, I'll be honest. I've, I've had my phone, my phone doesn't make noise. It'll, it'll vibrate if somebody texts me or calls me. Good. And I think I've had somebody call me with something that was time sensitive enough that it couldn't wait 30 minutes, maybe twice in my entire life. Right. Uh, there's just not that much that, that happens that can't wait 20 minutes. Um, but you, you said something that I thought was really interesting about context switching and, and something that I saw with, with context switching, uh, because in, in, in a previous life for me, I did a lot of, of speaking and education around productivity. And so um, one of the, the studies that I found was from somebody named Gerald Weinberg. And what, what they said is effectively for every additional task you add to context switching, you're doing a 20% time loss. So if you're doing five simultaneous tasks, 80% of your time is going to go to context switching. So if you take a 10 hour day and you're doing five things that you're switching between all the time, you're actually yep. only going to get two hours worth of work done, right? Um, and the, the other thing that you said that I, that I really thought was And you'll be exhausted. Is, it, well, yeah, you'll be totally drained because you did 10 hours of effort, but only two hours of work, yeah. right? And that's, a, that's such, a, such a depressing way to, to think about like your life is if you spend all of your time just doing the, 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 the switching of your mental frame so that you can do a different thing, but then you never get any actual work done in that new frame. You just start switching to another frame. There's a word for this. And you, you were talking about how people think they should be able to, to switch context like computers can. Um, but if you have a computer, like a CPU switches too often, it does something called thrashing, where it gets into yeah. this loop where it tries to switch between tasks and actually never does any work because it's switching too fast. And uh, it just locks your whole computer up. Right. And so even computers can't multitask the way that we sometimes ask ourselves to multitask. We have to allow right. for the fact that once you've done that frame switch, you have to actually do meaningful work or you're just blowing a bunch of time getting set up to work um, and then never actually working. The, the other piece that in my mind is super important is to take breaks and give your brain some time to rest. Mm -hmm. I'm sure... I'm, I have been there many times. I'm sure you have been too. Coding late at night, just wanting to get that one bug fixed. And it's just, you know, you change some code and like, I, I think it's fixed. And out of a sudden something else broke because of that. You just keep on going at it and it's just not happening. An hour or two flies by and it's still not happening. You know, you're overtired, go to bed at three in the morning, get up at seven and you take a shower and within a minute it comes to you. And 
right. and would have come to you in the first space already if you would have stopped and say, I'm tired. I need to, I need a break from this. I need to go on a walk. I need to do something. So important. Not a lot of people do it because we also have this, like, I need to finish um, drive. Uh, and sometimes it's actually much harder to finish and it will take you a lot longer than if you give yourself a small break, being at five minutes, being at a sleep, being at, you know, an hour of a walk being at just doing something completely different and challenging the other side of your brain. All of these things will help you to achieve, you know, getting your work done happier and faster overall uh, and less drained so that you can actually take some of your active time that you have left in your day, and not sit in front of, you know, the big screen and, and do something more meaningful because you're not drained. You don't need to just have your brain on autopilot because you're still trying to process all the things that happened in that day. Have you heard of the mm -hmm. Zygarnik effect? No. So there's this interesting research that if you do not complete a task, it lingers in the back of your head. And basically, even though you're not actively thinking about it, you're constantly, your brain keeps on in the background processing around that task. So the easiest way to, to get rid of that is to split your task into smaller achievable pieces. Yes. And basically say, hey, I just got this done. Fine. There's other stuff that I don't have done yet, but that's okay. I at least have this completed. And by completing something, instead of completing this big blog, your brain is not distracted by like, oh God, like how can I complete all these other things? Because our brains want to complete their work. Super interesting. No, I, super, yeah, super and, interesting. and I hadn't heard of that effect, but that, boy, have I felt it. <laughs> right? Yeah. No, I think that's a, that's, that's okay. So before we fell into this rabbit hole, you were going to tell us the startup that you built to address this problem. <laughs> I mean, yes. So the startup is called centered centered the app. Um, we built an app for your desktop that helps you with these methodologies. That is basically a work companion. You say what you want to do in the next work session, you hit play and we automatically turn your phone, turn your desktop into do not disturb, tell people on Slack that you're also away. So they see that there's a little wave emoji next to it and you won't get Slack notifications. So we basically automated a bunch nice. of this process. We have custom made research focus music. That is music that actually triggers recollecting getting closer and quicker into flow states. Um, that is, for instance, binaural it, beats. That is like one, one piece of it, a certain frequency that helps you yeah. to stay focused for longer, but also just like music that is not too exciting and not too boring at the same time, a certain beat pattern that a lot of people, it will help to get into this state of flow quicker. You can also you know, not a... use that and link your Spotify account if you... We have an engineer that likes to listen to Mumbleco when he codes, apparently. So, yeah. I love it. Yeah. There, um, there's a, an app that I've used in the past called brain.fm that has, it, yes. it, it only does the music. It only um, does the music. But that is, uh, that music is a cheat code. It really is. And their music is great. We're putting everything together in one package. So mm. you have, you have basically your virtual assistant. Think of like a Siri for productivity. His name is mm -hmm. Noah. Noah actually will chime in. He has like this lovely British voice. And Noah will tell you uh, when a task is due, when you should move on, when you should take breaks. But our desktop app actually also looks at the applications that you use. And Noah will nudge you when we think you get distracted. So say you switch from VS Code to Twitter, after mm. about 15 seconds, Noah will be very gently nudging you and asking you if Twitter could wait because we detect that that is a distraction from you right now. You can always correct that and say, no, I'm a social marketer. This is for me. This is what I do. Sure, sure. But, uh, but uh, you can basically customize your assistant to help you. Um, there are other voices that you can use as well. There's, for instance, you can, uh, with, your friend, uh, with your friend Cassidy, you can uh, flow together. She has actually provided us with her voice 
to uh, to get you to scold you when you're when you're getting distracted. So if you ever wanted that, um, you know, oh my group, goodness, it's doing great. <laughs> maybe maybe we'll maybe we'll have you scolding us one day. Um, yeah. but yes, so so you can really pick like your crowd of people with you and work with them. Last piece that Center does it connects you together. Think think of it like a like a virtual cafe. You can see other okay. people working really, really small. You can like hide it too if that's too much for you. But the effect of, okay, I see you on camera or not. You, it's up to you to turn your camera on or not. I cannot talk to you. We have a break chat feature, but like during flow time, I cannot talk to you, but I see other people being concentrated on their computer. The moment you turn your camera on yourself, you feel like, okay, there's a spotlight on me. I better not get up right now and do something else. Mm -hmm. I really should focus for the next 25 minutes. So we are just really helping you to get into the state of flow and stay there as much as you nice. can. People spend hours every day in our app just to get more work done. The craziest mm -hmm. part is, you know, you know, engineers are amazing at estimating how long things take. We never get it wrong. I'm joking. <laughs> we, we always get it wrong, basically. <laughs> yeah. Um, here, here's the crazy thing. Like the one piece that is specific about centered is that you have to time box your work. So you have to say, hey, I want to code with you for 25 minutes. And I think it will be done in 25 minutes. And in centered, if you use our methodology of like working in centered, taking breaks when we tell you to take breaks and so on and so forth, people get they work done 30% faster than they estimated. So we can actually be good at estimation. And most of the time we're under or, and we are overestimating is because we get distracted. Mm -hmm. how, cra how crazy is that? Like throughout our entire amount of completed tasks, people get their work 30% done faster, 31%-ish. It, it's yeah. mind-blowing. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, that that is really... Um... And, and, and like I can, I have had anecdotally days where I really focus down. I, I I can't tell if Cassidy is is trying to scold us to go faster right now. Actually, yeah, she just wants <laughs> us to code, I guess. <laughs> um, but but anecdotally, I've had days where I you know I shut the phone down and and you know there's nothing really going on that I need to pay attention to, so I can really focus. And you get to the end of those days. First of all, feeling like a million bucks because there's nothing better than just having one of those ultra productive days. But also you look at your list and you go, I never would have expected that I could have gotten this much done in a single day. Yes. Um, and that is, you know, that is such a, it's a very cool, it's a very cool feeling to be able to make that type of progress that quickly. Um, but yeah, so so all of this is a, is a good lead up to what we're going to build today, which is completely unrelated. Uh, we're going <laughs> to be working out of uh, on building dynamic images, right? We are. We are. So specifically, we had a, we had a handful of, of problems before here at Centered. Um, one, one of them is, how do you make pretty emails? Um, most of the time with images and specifically when you want to, we sent you, for instance, a daily email of your tasks that you have done, um, the people that started following you. Um, it has a pretty header that is custom, that has customized text in it. And you get that from your designer usually. And the first thing you like hand it back into their face and you're like, I can't code this. This is like, have you ever coded for emails? It's terrible. Like you cannot do this. And then you come up with solutions very quickly, hopefully. And one of our solutions was to, okay, cool, we can generate custom images and embed them in those mm -hmm. emails to have parts of these email, like a beautiful like leaderboard graphic or a task graphic or whatnot, um, just generate it and add it to that email. Um, other important piece of that is uh, social share images, OG share images, mm -hmm. right? You want them to look for every page different that say you build a block or whatsoever. And, uh, and this is kind of another way of like just taking that, some of the assets that you have and auto-generating custom images for that. Mm -hmm. Kind of makes sense, right? 
Yeah, it absolutely does. I think, and I think what's interesting about it too is that it it um, it's it's that hidden work, right? When you when you look at images, it's all you never think. You know, I need to write a blog, and that includes generating a social share image and putting an email together that I can put into the the email, and all these other things that need to happen. Um, yep. So it it's little stuff that adds up. And if you're a developer, you don't do design. Well, now it's like this piece of overhead that you either have to choose to ignore and your stuff goes out without images, which we know is a little less good than if you send it out with images. Um, or you have to go and ask the design team if they've got bandwidth, which they never do because they're always run at 120%. Um, so, you know, the this type of automation is is also just a, you know, I, I guess this does relate back. It's a huge productivity booster because it lets you stay in the flow of building the thing instead of doing the meta work that allows you to ship the thing. Yeah, or do you really want to, you know, have at the end have a system, say a blog, for instance, and have the content creator of that blog every single time, make sure they got an asset mm -hmm. from a designer to do it and so on and so forth. It's just yet another thing somebody has to do and it might just right. result in not getting as many articles done or like your article not launched on time. It's like just adding more and more dependencies. Um, we also know that content creators love to customize their pages. So it makes them mm -hmm. feel like it's their own, right? It's like, especially if you're on somebody else's platform, if you can change the background, if you can change, you know, parts of like the feel for your page out, it actually converts a lot better. It brings you more fans and like people like immediately recognize your brand that you created about yourself, um, of yourself. It's, I think it's table stakes at these days to do these things. Um, we're guilty. We're guilty uh, of it our, ourselves. We do not. We have this lovely feature of, of like study groups and, and uh, work groups. And if you share any of these URLs out, they don't have custom OG share images right now. Mm. But, uh, mm -hmm. but we're coding them today. So uh, hopefully I can steal some of the code that you've done. And, uh, and actually, and actually use it and then ship it this week. All right. So, uh, this, this is maybe a, a first. What he didn't where, know is that where... we're, we're actually going to make him work for centered right now. It's great. He didn't know that <laughs> it's, it's fine. You know, we got a productivity here, right? We can't just have a fun <laughs> conversation and not have an outcome, right? <laughs> All right. So, uh, so, okay. Uh, with that being said, maybe we can just hop over and, and start building this, right? So uh, all right, today on Learn With Jason, we're going to do feature work for Centered App. <laughs> all right. Let me, let me switch over to pair programming view here. And before we get started, I'm going to do a quick shout out. Uh, this episode, like all episodes, is being live captioned. It's on the homepage of learnwithjason.dev if you want to follow along. Uh, that is being handled by um, who's with us today. We've got Rachel today from White Coat Captioning. Thank you so much, Rachel, for being here. And that's made possible through the support of our sponsors. We've got Netlify, NX, and Backlight all kicking in to make the show more accessible to more people and just put a little more, uh, little more money behind Learn With Jason so we can do fun things. Uh, we are talking to Ulf today, so you can go follow Ulf on Twitter at Solf. Uh, and we were talking about Centered App, so let me drop another link to that. And that is about everything I know about what we're doing today. So I, uh, oh, what should I do first? So I shared with you a Figma file, because that's usually yes, how- this, how this Figma file it. here. Yes, shout up Kit Cassidy. Thank you for your image. Yeah, great. Turns out she likes uh, keyboards. Um, I so have heard what, that Cassidy likes keyboards. Um, what we're going to do is we're actually creating an OG share image um, dynamically with Node Canvas. So mm -hmm. if you want to create yourself, um, actually, we'll, we'll start here first. Let me see if I can get my mouse back here. I'm like in here too. So what does what does our very, very first OG share image look like? Um, they're first of all, they're fixed in, in size. They're 1200 by six. 30, that is at least what I found on the internet, it's supposed to be the standard for these share images. Um, mm -hmm. Then what we already have from our, um, here I can actually pull this over in one second. If I do this and click here and do some other stuff and magic and 
I put this here. If you can just follow me around a little bit, you can just observe me in Figma. Not to do that. There you go. Um, this is already a group page that we have. So we have assets mm. already set for basically this like beautiful covers, a background image on the footer, a custom header image. So what we're going to do is we're going to reuse these assets to dynamically generate for any one of these groups an OG share image and just slap our logo gotcha. in there for good measures and have us a little bit recognized as well that that's part of it. What does this? Um, what does our image consist of? Is a center cropped background image, mm -hmm. a cover to the right, a logo to the left, and I put a in this one. I actually put a blur layer on it. I think in our example, we're not gonna blur it. We're just gonna put an like black opacity layer on top of the background image, so we can make sure okay. it's it's a good method methodology because we don't know what our content creators upload but we want to ensure contrast. The easiest way to do that is put a, a semi-transparent like black layer on top of that image so you ensure that it right. has a certain amount of, uh, of contrast if you put something on top of it that we know we can control the color, for instance, white. Right. Here. And a so, uh, quick welcome to uh, to Alex Truss and friends who just showed up. You are right on time. What we are doing right now is we are going to uh, take this image in, in Figma here, this frame two, and we're going to dynamically generate these uh, using Node Canvas. So we were just walking, we were walking through uh, the image here on the right is what the centered app looks like. And this is uh, Cassidy Williams group, Freakin' Nerds. And over here, this is what, if someone shares a link to Freakin' Nerds, we want to show up as the, the social sharing image. So um, we've got the logo on the left, we've got the, the, the image on the right, and then there's this background image up top of the, the binary, so we wanna show that. And then Uf was just saying, we're gonna do a, a semi-transparent black overlay to make sure we have enough contrast. That's it. Any questions around oh. that so far? Is this is this super clear? I'm I'm feeling great about it. Uh, chat, how are you feeling about this? Any any questions so far? And and while we wait for the chat to think, we can I think just start uh, start doing any setup we need to do. Yeah, go create yourself uh, a node project in any way you'd like and whatever you're comfortable with. Um, I'm a TypeScript person, so I probably would do that in TypeScript. Is there a like a, a it just like a create TypeScript project? Is that what you're thinking, or is is there should be like a, a server, like an Express project? Um, it's it's whatever you like it to be. Um, if it, if you're super familiar with Express, why don't we just use that? That's actually kind of neat. Like if you can just know how to build yourself an Express server real quick that serves an image route, perfect. Okay. The way the way we're um, gonna render this image out, we're we are piping the output of our image from our canvas to you know our response. Got it, got it. Uh, so I'm gonna see if they've got a quick start for us so that we can. Looks like they don't. Is there? I'm gonna help you with that too here. Oh, do you have one? Yeah, handy. No, but I'm I'm gonna do exactly what you're doing, and we're just like googling a little bit around here. All right. So uh, I think like a, a basic API is probably the the default, right? Start start yourself a node package. I think that's a good start, um, right? right? So, so let's, to, like, let's npm it. init. So get init, and then we will npm init. It's been a while since I set up a, a node package from ah. scratch. Um, okay, so let's go with. Node canvas images. Oh, this is super readable. And I pasted you some code. Which okay, is just so an, gotta... it's just an express hello world here. Okay, great. So I'm gonna I'm gonna npm install. Uh, I'll just go back here to express. How about we search for, you know, the, the typical Express TypeScript starter. I'm sure there are 700 node packages that do exactly what we want. There's right. a good and one. So it's, I... called, it's called TypeScript Express Starter on NPM. I think that'll, that, that'll do what we need, hopefully, and probably way too much. 
right, let's no, go. Don't, type no, don't worry about it. Starter. We don't. We don't. We don't want this. We we don't want to create controllers and services and routes and models. Who makes these things okay. these days? Let's. You know what? Let's roll <laughs> with the the very simple. basic. I'm going to skip TypeScript because I don't want to have to set up the the build step for it. Um, I like and it. So what I will do is open this up. And then we got here, if I create an index.js and paste this in, then we have uh, a basic route. So we're going to mm -hmm. pull in Express, set up an app. We're going to use port 3000. The base route, so this is the, the, the yep. get. So we'll use a get request to get a route. And if someone hits that route, we'll send it hello world. And then we tell it to listen on our port, which is 3000. Um, and we'll just console log a little bit. So if I take all of that and I do a, an npm start, oops, I'm an npm run start. Nope. Same thing. Um, it looks uh, like you are missing something in your package package.json. Let's look at it. Um, oh. Yeah, we only have a test. That's it. That's it, right? So now it should be, nope, it's not running. Nope. It needs to run node index. Oh, so I just need to tell it to run this folder. Let's... Come on, autopilot. Please. One more time. L listening on port 3000. So if I come out here and I go to localhost 3000, we get our hello world, um, which is great. And if I come in here and edit this, we have gotta to restart. And restart. To restart it. You know, we don't get fancy hot reloading here. That's okay because uh, we we're kicking it old school today. It's going to be great. Um, gonna all be right. Fun. So I have a, a very basic Node Node Express server running locally. Absolutely. Next thing you want to do is you want to add um, the Canvas project. Okay. Let's see here. Is that um, Node Canvas? Canvas. It's just called Canvas. Just called Canvas. Okay. And let's see if that all worked for you. See a bunch of errors. My oh, mic is. So am I like my mic is like I'm popping, like I'm peaking. Yes, uh, let's are. see. Let me cut that a little bit. I did turn on the the input filter as much as I could. It was real bad the other day. Um, uh oh. Yeah, I think that got better. Dun 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 dun. Canvas command failed. Command failed. Oh no. This is always my favorite problem. Uh, let's oh, yeah. try. What don't you like? Response for um, or not found. You on an M1? Oh, wait. I am yeah. on an M1. Yeah, try to try to run Arc um, and run it like through Rosetta. Um, You're gonna have to tell me what those uh, words mean, unfortunately. <laughs> so there's a there's a there's a really easy way. Um, to, you know, there, especially in Noteland, there is a lot of times where like any binaries might not be compatible yet with, uh, with you know, it, Apple's latest chipset. So what you can okay. do is I'll show you and I'm going to send you something in our fancy chat. Um, you can prefix any, any command line command with arch and then say x86.64. And that will basically run everything in Rosetta. So on simulated Intel architecture. Ooh, so what do you okay. do is more fun. Oh yeah. That usually works, at least on my end. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Depends a little bit on also um, like how you have nodes set up. I Let's have nodes here. set up uh, through Volta. Oh, look, I'm old school on those ends. Um, run me Let's this. The node M1. Can't install, no, all right, yeah, okay. 
Um, let's see if I can node canvas M1. Has anyone solved this problem? Um, if you do me a favor, <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of node node M1 is a little bit of a pain sometimes, especially if you install it not quite the right way. We we still have a handful of x86 dependencies. Turns out this one might be one too. Um, so we install at least here at center node in x86 instead of on M1, like ARM architecture. Okay, um, let me see if I can Volta install x86. Volta so team, currently we don't support downloading 32-bit. That's not what we, we want the 64-bit. So. Let's see if I need to make a 32-bit like set node distribution x64 what that's something else you can also go super super old school and just download it and install node from nodejs.org oh my goodness uh How do you feel about let's that? see i feel weird about that um yeah. oh what if we use something like uh like code sandbox Ooh, let's try that um let's code also, sandbox Otherwise, I'm not sure if that is easy. Otherwise, I can drive here two for once and uh, walk you through it on, on my setup because I have it running on, on my machine here. We can try a sandbox first, see what happens. Let's see what happens with, I think the sandbox is just gonna work um, because that's, that's their whole thing. That's the whole thing to do. So I think it'll be pretty straightforward. Let's give it a shot. I'm gonna do an Express. I'm going to do a node, simple node. That'll at least get us started. And then uh, let's see what comes in. We've got Ooh. package JSON. We've got very little going on in here. So I'm going to add express. Okay. And, and, and I'm going to go into see if they allow my, us to do canvas. Yeah, let me let yeah. me grab this and just make sure this is going to do what I expect it to do. And let's save that and you restart. What does this one do? Toggle preview. Good. We just have to refresh, reload maybe. Maybe they already use note mod. No. Let's see. Close all. Where is it actually? Names. Is there a console? There's a terminal. There's a, yeah, there's a restart in here somewhere. Restart sandbox. Uh huh. Example app listening on three thousand. And there it is. Okay, so there's uh -huh. there's our running app. So let's install Canvas once uh, more. Canvas, which was where. Dependencies, we're gonna get canvas. Okay, fingers crossed. Okay. Here we go. Success. Yay! Done. Great. All right. So let's get in here and I think we're ready to roll. Cool. What you want to do is you want to import create canvas from the canvas package. Okay, so con now we'll go up here. Create canvas, require canvas. And it's probably, um, an, you probably want to have some curly braces around it. OK. I assume, at least. Gosh, I'm like so so out of like old school uh, Java syntax these days. <laughs> like, I, I, don't, I don't remember when I wrote require the last time around. But it looks like uh, uh, the good news is, is that we're still going to get some of that TypeScript. Love, Love it. Beautiful. So let's create us a canvas. So first of all, what we want to do is we want to actually not just get a slash there. We want to, I mean, it doesn't really matter. We, we can return a specific image, for instance, say OG image dot PNG. Okay. 
Beautiful. So now we're creating ourselves a new canvas. So you can create uh, you know, nothing for now. All right. Let me just uh, get over here. I'm going to restart our sandbox. And then we can go to uh, ogimage.png. Ta-da! it says to do image. Great. OK. Cool. Create a canvas with Create Canvas as a, as a constructor. Uh, inside a, my route or? Inside of your route, yes. So we're just okay. generating every time this route is hit for now a canvas. And, and it wants two parameters, um, the width and the height of the canvas, which is 1,200 by 630. 1,200 by 630. You got it. Cool. So and then lastly, what we want to do is we want to say canvas at the very um, in the next line. Um, we want to say da, 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 create PNG stream, create PNG stream. Exactly. Okay. And we want to pipe that thing actually with a with a dot pipe. Yep, to res. And you can get rid of, uh, and you can get rid of your uh, line fifty. Okay. So that so this should give us an us empty PNG, right? A PNG image. Oh, here we go. Reloading too fast. You're too fast. What does that mean? Back to the home page, okay, and then let's go to ogimage.png. Might a there you go. That sounds about right. So, okay, so first... it's it's given us nothing, but it, you can see here that there's a scroll, which yep. means that the image does exist. It's just currently blank. You can probably also try to like click drag it away from there, and then you should see like a white image for you or a transparent none, maybe not. There, it there is. you go. Woohoo! So there's our, there's our canvas. Oh, here yeah. it is. Maybe okay. good. <laughs> Beautiful. So what's what's the first thing? Um, what do we want to do? We want to, so Node Canvas is basically a, a Node implementation of, of Canvas. So we can do mm -hmm. anything that we want to do on, you know, normal front end Canvas. Um, the right. very first, first thing is what we want to do is we want to draw an image. Yep. Right. So with that, we are we have to load it first, um, mm -hmm. and that is uh, there is a load image function um, that is being supplied by the canvas package as well. And so are we you wanna, doing that before or after the pipe? Um, we're gonna do at, the pipe is the very very last command here uh, that we're sending out. So you can add up plenty of lines that will fill in here. So okay. you wanna you wanna import load image um, in addition to create canvas from canvas. Beautiful. So and then we are actually um, loading an image. I'm gonna t give you an image to load. So we are um, we actually have like a fun image here to load. Give me one second. Here you go. So it's an async function. Uh, oh, here it is. I just sent you like a URL to an Copy image. link. And it's an async. So do I need to make this? Yes. You can. And so you want to await that. And you want to load that image, big, long image. It's just a pretty, pretty nature image. OK. Um, OK, so next piece, what we want to do is we want to center crop these images. Um, and we're going to call name that image background image. Got it. Like, like or BG image or something like that. Yes. So next thing is so that, you know, we don't have to just talk through some, you know, boring math. Um, I'll send you, if I find our conversation again, which I don't, oddly. Where are you? 
There you are. That was Jason. The challenges of, of working across seven windows here. Seriously. Um, um, right, let's see. So I sent you, I sent you me. a little bit of copy pasteable content. I did it not know. Oh. All my, all the line breaks got, got weird, but that's okay because I can read code. <laughs> see here we go. One of these. And and that, then, then we'll walk you through this code. You probably right. want to have right. like okay, every, so every line in here. Image. Yeah, BG image. So what we're going to do is like we get, you know, vertical and, uh, and uh, horizontal ratio. So we want to see if it's either landscape or portrait image and, and take the larger ratio. Then we transpose the image away from, uh, from the camera width so that we're basically centering it. And, uh, and then lastly, um, we still need a context, but we're drawing our uh, image into that context. So gotcha. before line 13, we want to create a variable called context, CTX, and we want to say canvas. Exactly. You know exactly what we want. Wait. Ready? Hey, canvas? Maybe... Nope. No. A canvas. We want to get our get context. Get context. That's what I was saying. Get context. Okay. And um, the parameter is 2D as a string. That's it. Okay. Beautiful. And so right. what are we doing? We're drawing the background image center cropped on the canvas. You want to, got you want it. to see got how that it. works? And obviously, we're loading the image first. This could also be the image could already be like locally on disk or whatsoever. We're loading that from a URL. So you, this works in both ways. Load image can take a local file URL or another URL. It's good. Okay. So here is Print our image. image. And, cropped. and if we reload, it's cached. Oh, no, it's not. It pulls a different one. Yep. Very cool. Okay. It's a little Great. like API endpoint that we actually build ourselves that gives you a bunch of pretty curated images. That's really fun. Awesome. Um, Thank you for the sub, Charlie. All right. So so now we've got a background image. Um, and so if if this was me, my my gut says the next thing I need to do is overlay that semi-transparent black to give us enough contrast. Oh man, you're hired. <laughs> Good. So so let's do that. Um, right. The first thing the first thing we want to do is so we draw things on the context that is like that we have from our canvas canvas. So this is a very very simple like operation on the context. It's called a rect. So we say okay, so... ctx.rect. Oh, wait, rect. I did it wrong. Yep, That's just R-E-C-T. -E yep. And, uh, and we start on 0, 0. 0, 0. And then it's going to be 1,200 by 630 so that it's the full thing, right? I hear you. The the software engineer in me would like to call you out on that and say, gosh, now I have to, you know, if I want to generate an image like in a different size, now I have to change it on two places. Magic numbers. So I've done magic numbers. I would get it you from want 100%. canvas width, canvas, canvas dot width and canvas dot height. Oh, I didn't realize that was a thing. It is a thing. We already used it for our center fill. Oh, here it is. Okay, great. See, this, this is what happens when you copy pasta, friends. <laughs> still gotta, it's still got to understand the code. <laughs> That's right. Like That's a, right. Okay, so like a, uh, so we so have we're drawing a... Direct. Yep. And then we want to set the fill style on the context. Next line. Uh, not next as line. a parameter. It's the next line. Welcome to Canvas programming. Fill style. And that's uh, we. It's not a function. It's actually a variable. Yep. And we're giving it um, a hex value. So hash zero zero. Zero zero. Zero zero. All black. And now we're giving it um, a transparency value. Like try try AA. Beautiful. Okay. So and R G, G B, B alpha. Oh, that that eight-digit hex throws me sometimes, but it's it's so nice that that's supported now. 
Um, I think you could okay. also just write RGB. Um, I'm I'm just not hundred. I'm so used to eight digit hex. Sure. Probably. I, I like my transparency in there. Um, last piece is you want to fill the context. So you okay. call context.fill. Any Beautiful. arguments? No arguments. We are all good. So try to regenerate your image. All right. But don't do it too fast. Okay, there so now we've Looks got a, lot a much darker. Yeah, much darker. If we refresh, we should see that all of them kind of come out. Yeah, we've seen this one before. So this is the darker version of these these ferns with that overlay on them. Beautiful. Fun. So we're already halfway there. Yeah. I mean, what, what dust our hands off? Head home. We're we're I'm going on break. Not quite yet. Not quite yet. <laughs> but, you know, one one work stretch first. Uh, so that we feel great about it and we can take our break and actually celebrate our wins, right? Mm -hmm. uh, let's get let's get let's get Cassidy's face in there, or at least you know, partial covered face in there. So what are we gonna right. do is you tell me what we're gonna do next. Uh, so my guess is we're going to do something very similar to this. So I'll take this and pull it down here, and we will say uh, image. And then yeah, let's call I it need... a, Let's call it a, like a poster image, maybe. Okay. Poster image. And then it. we'll get uh, a URL that will load in that image for us. And I'm then gonna we're going to need to position URL. it. And to position it... We want, uh, let's see, this is going to be draw image. So we put in the image itself. It's start X, start Y, and then the width and height. So we need to figure out here in our Figma, this image is at 814.51, and then it's 336 by 528. So those will be our arguments to put the image in place. And then do we need to crop these, or are these going to be? We don't. Uh, they're they're already cropped. They're already okay, consistent perfect. and cropped. Perfect, perfect, perfect. So that makes so it So I easier. sent you also the image. All right. So now what I can do is context draw image. And in this, we're going to do poster image. And we'll start at, let's go back over here so I can remember, 81451. Mm -hmm. 81.51. And then we know that this is going to be uh, 336 by 528. Now, if we were going to make this more resilient, we could probably do that as a, a percentage and then calculate these sizes so that if we resize our OG image, it would be the right uh, the right blend of, of aspect ratios. Um, yep. What else needs to go in there? So That's 528 it. And then center shift. Since there is no center since shift. we're not moving it or changing anything, this is it. This is all we needed to render this image in there. Okay, perfect. So then. That should be it. It should be done. Do you want to try? Why don't you like? What are you mad about? Oh, I forgot the comma. Let's give it a shot. There we go. Look at it. Wow! Amazing. Look at that, everyone. Like magic. But but, but you know, here's the thing. The designer came and says, well, this is great, but we don't want these, you know, Th they get hurt physically. And I think mentally when they see any, you know, non-rounded corners, they don't feel mm -hmm. safe mm -hmm. if there are no rounded corners around images. So what we need to do is to actually build a mask around this and okay. mask that image, give it a little bit of rounded corner look. So I sent you a little bit of code that you get to translate from TypeScript. It's fun. Now you just remove the types. It's really just a simple. little bit of TypeScript. Yeah. So that we good. don't okay. that we don't have to do through and actually it's it's just a function um, that draws a, a rounded rect. Um, okay. In I'm going to stick so, this up here. Yep. Just and a little helper function. Uh, now you got to do your new line thing. Got to do the new line thing. Got to drop out the TypeScript because we didn't set up for that. I feel so dirty. It's great. <laughs> this is, this is um, my role in life is to just introduce 
more chaos via lack of types. Um, let's see here. So yep, you got it. Context begin. A bunch of these. All right, so we're moving the context. We're creating a little arc. We're creating another arc, and then we just keep on moving our context, closing our path. And mm -hmm. you can see there, it, it's just slightly math around. Like the last argument is a radius, basically. Got it. Yeah, the arc. The arc two um, is that's like th these are SVG drawings, right? They are not. They are. This They're is not. all based on canvas. So yeah, slightly right. different, A similar concept, but uh, but not anything SVG. This is really just rendered out into pixels. Uh, um, so what are we what are we doing next? Is we cannot just draw direct because we actually want to clip it, right? So mm. what we're going to gonna do before we draw that you know cover image. If you go back mm -hmm. to your main uh, your main function, the rounded rec one should be fine. Cool. Before we draw the post image, what we're going to do is we save our context. So we say context save. Next thing is we draw our rounded rec. Okay. That is just you like just call what rounded rec, um, not on context. Just call our helper function that we built. Oh, I got you. Yeah. Okay. So and where do we run, where do we draw it from? Exactly the same position than than the image. Um, A fourteen fifty one thirty three exactly. Again, like eventually, I would want to pull that out into its own variable. The first parameter of rounded direct is context, and the last parameter right. of rounded direct is X, it's y, a radius. Radius. Are we gonna give so our radius is pixels? what do you think? 10. Sorry, what was it? 10. Beautiful. Next line, now we actually have to tell Canvas to clip it. So we say context clip. That's it. We just call that. Then we draw our image and then we restore our context so that we don't we get out of this clipping. Uh, okay. Restore. And so, restore is so this and 60, 60, what is that? 66. Um, the, it's not safe. It's restore. Restore. Yep. Gotcha. Okay. So let me, let me step through this because we're doing something I've never seen before. When we save the context, we are. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to try to reason my way through this and then you can tell me where I'm wrong. So we are saving our context, which basically tells it to pause on actually rendering things. Is that correct? And so we're, we're saying, okay, so we're about to do a group of things. So we save the context, we draw this rectangle, then we say use that rectangle as a clipping path, and then we drop the image into the clipping path. And then when we restore the context, that's like committing all three actions at once. Exactly. It's committing all of these together. Okay. So the important part is that the moment you anything that happens after context clip, mm -hmm. it will be clipped by that rectangle. And so this. So this if you save would draw an restore, image, like, yeah, go for it. The, so this the save and restore is is effectively saying like we want to do this clipping path, but we need to make sure that it's contained to only the image we want to clip and not to everything else that we do because we're going to add text and we're going to do some other stuff. Exactly. Which if we didn't do the save and restore would get caught by that clipping path and therefore be invisible because we're going to place it outside of the, the clip path. And you would have one of these like 2 a.m. debugging sessions, like trying to understand mm. why your text is not showing up. You did everything right because it was yes. clipped away. Yes. Okay. So with that, now <gasps> we have Beautiful. rounded corners. Now our designers will be happy again. Beauty. Okay, so uh, so I think the next thing then is we need to place the logo, right? Now the Let's... logo, same kind of deal. Um, so is, that, what... is that correct? Not quite. What I would like to do with you, and this is this is um, still I haven't prepared for this, so we, we're both doing this together and treading doing it live. these waters. So we're doing this live. So I would like to get this exported as a PNG. And actually load it not from a UL and load it from disk and see if that's in any way different. So gotcha. you can 
get rid of the second SVG export. Exactly. Let's uh, let's see. It looks like I don't have. Let you, huh? the, yeah, but that's oh. okay because I can export both and then grab the one that go. I need. I I deleted it. Uh, well, you're faster. Beautiful. So here's our PNG. We want the PNG. We want the PNG. There's the PNG that we need. So if I come over here, uh, I should be able to add Just, a file. Right. Upload, upload files. files. Okay. So now we have this dark.png, which looks great. And if I come down here, I want to load that. Now, if I do a load image, can I use just a relative path or do we need something different? I believe you can use a relative path. Um, you're just a little out of context. You want to write this line above 68. Yeah. Here. Yes. Beautiful. All right. So we're going to await load image, and that's going to be our dark.png. So I'm just going to from the file. And let's, uh, let's do the same thing we did here. We're going to context draw image. Yep, uh, super we're simple. We're going to stick that down here and change out our values. So this is, let's get this one, and it's 121, 252. Uh, 121. 252 and then the width and height are 462 and 114. 462, 14. Okay. And you and want to draw the to logo draw image, the... right? Yes. Okay. So theoretically that speaking, if all, if all goes well, this just does what we want. So let me go over here, restart our sandbox. Will it blend? Reload the page. And centered. All right, let me pull this out Magic. here. And look at that, friends. So, I mean, like, chat, you can see how how freaking powerful this is that we were able to do this, you know, this quickly uh, by just placing things where we want them on the screen. This is this is very, very cool. Um, but yeah, I, yeah, and how so quickly I, you can translate it now from something like Figma, from something that a designer gives to you, and you know where absolutely. your assets are, and just have it render up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really, really, really cool stuff going on here. So this is uh, this is fantastic. And um, and chat, yeah, I think I think the audio crackling is because I'm peaking and I need to turn down the gain on my mic. But the gain on my mic is over here. And I am not going to make you look at a blank screen while I go figure out how to do that. So I'll fix it for the next <laughs> stream. Um, okay. So, Ulf, is there anything else you wanted to add to this? Um, or are we calling this success? I think uh, we call this success. There's something I would like to point out, which is very cool, which is, you know, the one more thing that, that a lot of people want in this. And that is you can use Canvas actually pretty successfully to render text as well. We're not gonna do this right now, but I urge you to look into the, the load image, uh, the load font function, it, wrong, the register font function uh, that the Canvas project has. You can basically create a TTF font and register it and then like on front end Canvas, use that font, draw, basically pixels in that specific font anywhere in your canvas. Really cool if you want to do like custom text like hi Jason or whatsoever in your email headers. Super powerful. Um, and and again, this library is very fast too, which is the other big piece. Again, it's like a production example. We probably don't want to generate these images every single time. Um, you know, I could think of like generating them once on like a next deploy, for instance, or, you know, actually have a database trigger when actually some of this data changes and generate them and put them somewhere, upload them. We showed how to pipe them directly from Canvas out to your response, but obviously you can get a buffer, you can get any sort of, you can get a PNG, whatever you need out of this. I got of it. It's great. I muted myself because I have contractors in my house. But <laughs> um, so the, the one of the things that I see that that's really high potential here that that's um, 
looking at this code, we could actually run this in a serverless function. And I, I think if you were to yep. look at this, uh, I, I, I believe I've seen some examples that are pretty similar here. Um, but like I have a, a real world example that I can show you that uh, doesn't use Node Canvas, but that does generate uh, images on the fly. If you go to learnwithjason.dev and you go to any one of the episodes, uh, so we'll go to episodes here, and you uh, click on one of these, like we just had chance on the show, and then you just add slash poster dot JPEG. It will build this. Now this is automatically generated. I this this file doesn't actually exist. It's a serverless function, right? And if you go and look at the code on learnwithjason.dev, I can share this in the chat for anybody who's interested. Um, this is the uh, the way that this is set up. You go into the site, and then we've got the functions, and then we have the uh, poster somewhere. I think it's under what I call it API episodes. Yeah, episode, and then this is a little messy, but buried down here under poster is you can do a schedule, you can do starting soon, or you can do poster. And if it is one of those, then it will build out, uh, in this case, a Cloudinary URL. But the general, same general idea, if you you could have this load up a canvas and you could you you know load the images that you need. Uh, I load these images out of Sanity and a combination of Sanity and, and Cloudinary. So the, the guest images are in uh, Insanity, the, the, the images that don't change are in Cloudinary. Um, and then I have, you know, we, we load text in and we load in the, the title of the episode and stuff like that, all on the fly, on demand. And then the, the really interesting thing here is I use Netlify's on-demand builders, which means that after this is generated once, it's in the cache and it'll get served like a regular static asset uh, for every other request until the site gets built again. So you could do exactly that same thing with what we just built here, where this could be rendered once in a serverless function by Node Canvas, and then using an on-demand builder, it would never have to be rendered again uh, until you rebuilt your site. So a lot of really interesting opportunities here to, to build some just super high performance custom images. Um, and if you're interested in learning about how those work, I can drop a link. Uh, there we go. And I'll just drop one of these in the chat for y'all so that uh, anybody who wants to learn how those work. And then I link to the sites, you can find those. And, and then if you do want to play with one of these, you can change the poster to uh, schedule, for instance. And it's almost the same, but it includes the date and stuff like that, right? So little fun things that you can do with these images to very quickly generate a lot of different versions for all these different things. This is how I power Twitter and, and all of that stuff. And you know now you have this code so you can do exactly the same thing and build these beautiful images on demand without, you know, work with your designer once on a template and then you're off to the races. You never have to do that, uh, that meta work again. Super cool. So Ulf, uh, for somebody who wants to take this further or learn more, do you have any recommended resources or anything that, uh, that we want to link to here? Their, their, um, their NPM, um, package like their description is actually pretty good and again just reading about how canvas programming works it's slightly different right it's it's all um built on canvas you, you know all this code you could do on mm -hmm. the client as well which is very very cool especially for like quickly iterating on it you could just copy paste this code and basically run this in javascript on a client not even on a on a server and get exactly the same image generated. Um, so they, cool. there's even more to that, where you could, for instance, generate a lot of these images directly on the client and not even on your server. A lot of, you know, I like I like Canvas. It's, it's fun. Um, it has the best of both worlds in my mind. And, and, and that's like, uh, I don't know if you all have seen like uh, meme generators, right? Um, but if you look at a meme generator, a lot of these kinds of tools are, are sort of doing that thing where, you know, you can say like, uh, what is, which one is it? It's text one, text two. So it's like chat, yep. capacity, right? You can do stuff like that, right? And you can, you can do these very quickly. And when you go to generate, it actually builds that as an image. So this, this may not be using node canvas, but it's using something very similar where it's, taking canvas and it's placing things around so that you can edit and move them. And then when you're done, it, it commits that, right? And so it makes a very yeah. fun client side editing experience. 
think of it like you can out of a sudden share the code that you use on the back end to generate this image with your front end where you like live generate mm -hmm. the image on the front end you don't have to wait for a back end you don't have to pay for any server costs you just live generate your canvas and then that same code could be used on the back end to actually render it out and save it and, and make it shareable or put it in the cloud function yeah yeah really yeah, it's fun really 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 powerful stuff um all right so oh I'm going to send people to your Twitter. Uh, where else should people go if they want to find you online? Yes, um, they can find me on Centered. I'm working on Centered every single day. Our whole team is on it. So if you ever want to hang out in our break chat, we have this whole concept. When you are on a break, you can talk to anybody who is also working. Sounds kind of fun. Uh, you can ask me there any questions. You can send me a DM at Solve. You can send me an email at like my first name, three letters at center.app. Many ways to like get a hold of us. Um, if you check out Centered in general, we have a Slack community as well on our website. So you can join there and like have always direct access to us. Great. All right. Well, with that, I think we're going to call this one a, a smashing success. We were able to build yes. uh, a very cool automatic image generator. Let me send this to the chat, actually. Uh, let me get the public. Everyone can view copy sandbox link. All right, here you go, everyone, if you want to go play with that. Uh, and on top of that, we had uh, what a wonderful conversation about productivity and, you know, getting giving yourself some space to not only get a lot of work done, but also have a uh, less of a sense of exhaustion after you do that work. Uh, really enjoyed that chat. So oh, thank you so much for taking some time with us today. Chat, as always, thank you for hanging out. Uh, let me do another shout out to our live captioning. We've had Rachel with us all day from White Coat Caption. Thank you very much, Rachel, for being here. And that's made possible through the support of our sponsors, Netlify, NX, and Backlight. I'll kick in to make the show more accessible to more people. And while you're looking at things on the site, make sure you go and check out the schedule. We've got some really fun stuff coming up. Um, we are going to talk to Faraz from Railway on Thursday. We're going to deploy a site with self-hosted analytics. So if you want to use analytics, um, but you don't want to set up uh, Google Analytics or something like that, we're going to walk through how you can actually do that. Uh, we're going to do it on a Next.js site. If you're interested, that's going to be a really fun one. And then uh, next week, we're going to dig into building and deploying React apps from mono repos. That is going to be a ton of fun. Uh, if you work on big teams, this is a big challenge, figuring out how to do code access control without having hundreds of repos and all those sorts of things. So this is going to be a lot of fun. With that being said, uh, I'll have a few more episodes up soon. Um, so you can follow on Twitch if you want to get the notification when I go live. You can add on Google Calendar, and that will show you in your calendar what is coming up. Uh, and those are automatically updated. So you see those going. And you can always subscribe on YouTube. We now have uh, just a ton of YouTube content. Let me get to this channel. Where is it? I learned with Jason. Oh boy, could have been ready with this link, y'all. Um, make sure you go and subscribe. We got uh, we got me and 26,000 of my favorite friends are, are over there on, on Learn With Jason's YouTube right now, uh, posting new videos as they come out from this episode, I would really appreciate a uh, subscribe and, you know, we'll do all the things so smash that like button, ring the bell, whatever it is you're supposed to do with that. I'm going to call this one a win. Oh, thank you so much for hanging out. We will see Thanks you. Thanks for having uh, me. See y'all next time. Bye.